Hello and welcome back to Vesalia Tales. In the previous episode we were disappointed to discover that the Carthaginians have effectively defeated our enemy the Khaleesi, meaning we weren't able to steal any new territory in Iberia. Over in the east Artemios made a dangerous move through the wintry forests hoping to get around the Caturoi blockades. We got a new enemy, the Gerha, on behalf of another Arabian faction, hoping to expand Cretius' influence there. Some bad news was that Iphianassa and Eusebius, our mighty hero, died in the last episode, so now there's a power vacuum the other officers must fill. The forces of Gohaia came out to attack Epiphroditos, who was caught by surprise in the field and had to escape to wait for Cretheus. Cretheus was busy putting down Edessa, a settlement controlled by the Parthians. They tried to fight to defend their settlement, but they were severely outclassed, and Cretheus was easily victorious. Artemios seeking battle was caught in a dangerous situation between the Catuori and the Sagarauka and had to escape. In the west we started deploying more forces towards Britannia, hoping to reinforce Heracleides in case a campaign against the Asini needs to take place. Artemios still seeking action manages to find a relatively undefended Catuori settlement which we're now going to attack. With Mesopotamia under Cretheus' heel, the nobles of the city were entitled, as part of the Republic, to sail west to Massalia and become part of the Massalian Council. There they found a welcoming hotbed of resistance to the actions of Cretheus and other far-flung Massalian commanders. With Massalians now a minority on the Council, it was easy for the collective of conquered peoples to scheme against the works of the Timukoi. The Timukoi had of course been careful to curtail the Council's powers so far as to make it a puppet, but the fact remained that many rich men were plotting to undermine the Republic. In Mesopotamia, schemes were hatched to break the integrity of the invaders. It's been a long time since the Daemons last saw battle, but finally it's time for some action as Artemios leads them against this minor Caturoi settlement. First, he's sending all the archers in to attack along the main face of the enemy settlement, where the enemy's archers are also set up to fire back. So the archers unleash their arrows, firing over the enemy's initial defensive line to hit the archers behind. Luckily for me, the enemy archers decided not to fire back, or at least the vast majority of them did. A couple of men in the regiment are seen firing a few arrows off, but they uh, must have been slightly out of range or something because we were able to hit them with impunity for the most part. So that means this first regiment at least is going to be wiped out before we make any further advances, so that's quite handy. The enemy do have much more archers, they've got uh, horse archers and regular archers to deal with, so ideally we want to cut those guys all down and then move in to destroy their heavy infantry with javelins and our own heavy infantry. That first unit of archers routes, but very quickly they're going to move in more archers to stand in exactly the same position conveniently for me. So my archers don't have to move <laughs> in order to keep firing at the enemy, it's very generous of them to uh, do their own manoeuvres to suit my strategy perfectly. So in they come, this second regiment was slightly more willing to fire back by the looks of things, but still not really going to be a problem. My archers are far superior both in terms of skill and number, so we'll keep raining arrows upon this regiment. I think this is actually two regiments standing right next to each other, and because their formations into Twining, we're going to get even more kills than normal, so it's perfect. Here are my archers firing with the main line quite far behind them, actually. You can see I've got them in a weird formation with one unit in front to take the brunt of the enemy's return fire, although there isn't much of that fire. The enemy, though, decides that this isn't a good idea, so a wise decision from them, and they decide to actually move out to challenge my archers. Their horse archers run forward to rain arrows upon me, and I move back, and they're actually now charging out all of their melee troops, too. So the battle is not going to go quite as I had intended. We're not going to be able to finish off their archers. The enemy are coming out to fight, but that's fine, too too, because of course the daemons as well as being specialists at range are specialists in melee. Their heavy troops are going to be well able to resist the enemy. You can see the archers they're still trick shotting their way as they <laughs> attempt to escape from the enemy. So we are slightly downhill, not in the ideal deployment position, but Archimios is not going to move. You can see him, he's got a blue helmet here, you can just about see him in there. An arrow just narrowly missing him here, <laughs> hitting the shield of his guard beside him. Hard life being a new commander on the field, he needs to earn the trust of his troops, but this battle should be a relatively easy one to do it in. The enemy's medium infantry is coming down to fight with my heavies, so even though the enemy has a little bit of a hill advantage, it's going to be fine. My men absolutely elite in comparison to the enemy. Plus, as you can see, the enemy's whole army has barreled out along that one approach, meaning all the other entrances to the town are now open, so my flanking forces can actually come in and capture the town uh, without having to face any enemies, which will reduce the enemy's morale. 
Their horse archers were potentially an issue because they're going to be raining arrows into my uh, tightly packed heavy infantry. But all of my archers now can be repurposed to just fire into these tight formations of horses with infantry among them to take the missing shots as well. So overall, things going absolutely fine. The most interesting move the enemy made was an attack by some spears on a flanking unit of jabs that I didn't even notice while playing. The jabs were not on skirmish mode, so they were able to engage my skirmishers in melee, but these jabs have gold experience and are super elite, <laughs> so they probably would have actually survived in that melee, but at that moment there was a chain route anyway because I cavalry attacked the back of the enemy's main force. It's a decisive victory for our Artemios. It was all we expected, given the balance bar, even though we've done significantly better than auto resolve would have given us. Let's have a little a look at the battle results should be no surprises here the enemy force completely destroyed most of them just surrendering at the end there and the town now up for grabs losses absolutely tiny double figures the enemy losing was 2,000 troops so we're going to occupy this settlement so we now actually have a Massalian base on the Black Sea which up to now we didn't have we were only relying on allied territory it's an interesting settlement it's actually part of a, a much bigger and weirdly shaped province Ponto Caspia which means it's gonna be pretty hard to actually take other provinces uh, other regions sorry in this province so we're gonna have to deal with just this little one but that should be fine we're just going to use it as a base to resupply really nothing major needs to happen here so now moving on the Kajiroi don't really respond or counter-attack to my invasion which is good and now Gahaya comes offering a peace offer. treaty I saw the chance was high I put in the deal of client state and it was still high so this is interesting information the enemy clearly think we have the advantage they're willing to be my client state but right now with the war still not really started I wanted to see if I could actually take their territory because it would be nice to have their port cities to use to move east and construct new fleets so we're going to continue the war and now, amazingly, right after I move away from RK Bosphorus, they finally get in gear and actually make the attack I was waiting for for so many years in the game. So now Artemios can move the victorious Daemons of Polymus back to support the other Daemons of Polymus, the ones commanded by RK Bosphorus, in this siege of the city. There was a small Katyuroi navy nearby, but I thought it was unlikely they could actually come and take the place back because the small garrison is already enough to resist a naval landing. So we are going to sit near this city here and try and take part in the battle. Far over in the west, our forces are continuing on towards Britannia, now linking up with a naval escort, which doesn't really help, but uh, it, just in case something goes wrong on the way, they will now be safe. So it's going to be many turns before they actually get there, but soon Britannia will be reinforced. In Mesopotamia, it's time to move out against Gehaia, having, uh, having sorry, turned down their peace deal. I noticed I can actually use roads to get there. You can see I was a little preemptive with Cretius moving south towards Epaphroditos. He didn't really need to go down there, should have just taken the road. For Epaphroditos, it's actually faster to go cross country, so we are going to march divided, fight united on this campaign. They're going to both take alternate routes to the same location, and hopefully they will meet up before any battles take place. Now moving on, Archibosphorus makes their attack against the Kiatiroi and the Daemons of Polymus are getting involved, <laughs> both for us and for Archibosphorus. You can see their version is a, a militia army with upgraded equipment that's suspiciously damaged. I think they've actually already fought the Kiatiroi over the city because the Kiatiroi are damaged as well. So they must have fought to a victory when the Kiatiroi sallied and now they really do need our support to make this attack. You can see the balance bar is really far in our favour but I was curious to see what this battle was like after all the hype so we're going to go in. What a surprise. The moment victory is about to be ours, the Massalians show up to take the credit. We waited so long for them to leave so we could make this attack ourselves, but they can't help but swoop in to steal the glory. Well, at least now when people say it was the Daemons of Polymus who conquered the Keturoi, they will be referring to we brave Pesphorans as well. One day we shall be free of our chaperones, my friends. But until that glorious day, we shall let them sit and watch while the privilege of battle is enjoyed by we the deserving. I want doubled crews on those ladders. I want this city in our hands before a single prancing Massalian reaches the walls. Arge Bosphorus makes their attack quickly, bringing up loads of ladders towards the northern wall of the city. 
Most of their militia forces, interestingly, you can see, are a mix of different cultures, it seems. They've got steppe peoples and Greek stuff going on, sort of combined at once, using Greek weapons with mixed armour and uh, mixed ethnicity of the soldiers. And they've got loads of those units pushing loads of ladders going up against the long, extended northern wall of the city, which is currently covered in enemy archers. Luckily, the rainy day is going to make any fire attacks on the ladders difficult. They've got a few melee units positioned there as well. You can see they've got some spearmen in this position. But overall, they haven't deployed deployed any of their proper spearmen onto the walls. They've only got light forces defending their first redoubt. The other daemons of Polymus for the Massalians are coming on at a completely different approach to where the enemy are making their attack, and because the enemy haven't waited for us to come and reinforce them, our forces are going to be completely uninvolved in this battle. It's going to be entirely up to the Archaebosphorans to deal with this. As they advance with the ladders, the enemy's archers start unleashing arrows on the bearers. Luckily, they are shielded by a ceiling of their shield, and the arrows aren't doing much damage. The ladders are easily able to reach the walls. None of the ladders catches fire, so they're going to have as many entrances to the enemy town as possible. And of course, with only light forces on top of those walls, they're going to quickly be able to capture them and start opening the gates as well. The rest of their army is still waiting out of archer range for these elite forces leading the attack to do so. So they jump in and start engaging with the militia and archers. You can see this officer knows the score because he rushes instantly to go and capture one of the enemy's towers, a priority, because that tower will cut down the Archibosphoran troops at close range if they don't take it soon. The enemy's troops probably don't have much hope anymore, so they are now going to be gradually defeated by the superior hoplites of Archaebosphorus. These hoplites aren't even particularly good, they're only militia hoplites, but still far superior to what the enemy has to offer, plus Archaebosphorus has upgrades and experience on their troops. So the majority of the defenders on the walls are quickly routed. The towers are captured and the gatehouses are captured, meaning Archibosphorus can bring in reinforcements. You can see from the balance bar, our side has a gigantic advantage. I don't know how much of it is because of my troops, the Messalian troops. Probably quite a lot because Archibosphorus' army is really damaged. They don't waste any time in advancing further into the town. At this point, the Caturoi finally decide to deploy their proper melee units to try and stop the Bosphorans' advance. But it's not going to be enough. The Bosphorans can now reinforce with the rest of their army. And the Massalians, way out there, as you can see, are so far away, there's pretty much no chance of them arriving in time for the fight. The Bosphorans were really rapid in their advance. They pushed up with their cav right through the town and actually met no resistance until finally they reached the very core of the enemy's defences, where it seems the Caturoi had held the majority of their force in reserve, just defending their final capture point. So now the riders who've come over and discovered this are in enormous trouble. They're hit with a barrage of arrows, javelins, and then heavy lancer charges from the Caturoi cavalry, and their unit is wiped out in mere seconds. A second unit, a similar unit, hired riders following, has to make a decision as to whether they're going to charge up and attack the enemy now that they know that they're there. They seem to be indecisive, but while they're sitting there deciding, they're taking bolts, arrows and javelins from the troops inside. Eventually, the Kachiroi start coming out to fight them and they are drawn into the fight, but they're very quickly going to be defeated. The Kachiroi have a distinct advantage locally and these Scythian hired riders are wiped out by the Kachiroi's superior horsemen. So, now it's going to be up to the infantry to try and capture that position, and infantry is what our Bosphorus has plenty of, you can see all their spear regiments advancing in a column towards the centre of the city, and backing them up actually is the Celtic cavalry from Artemius' army, which has moved up to capture a point in the centre of town. I rushed them in just in case they could take part in the battle in any way. So the Archibosphorus spearmen move up and the Caturoi deploy their cavalry to try and stop them. Not an ideal move, but they don't have much choice at this point. So the spearmen will gradually work their way through these cavs. You can see the Archibosphorus commander now coming to join the fight as well. He's got Thorax legionaries, the sort of troops that the Messalians thought they were special for using, but it seems now Archibosphorus have taken up the habit of using legionary-style troops. So as for my Celtic Cav, I started moving them around to rear attack the enemy's position, but then I spotted that they've actually got heavy lancers covering the entry I would need to make into the centre of the town, so my Cav wouldn't be able to beat them and had to abandon it. But later on, those lancers were distracted and went to fight with some of the enemy's spears, so my Cav came in to make a second attempt. The problem here is that the enemy has tons of skirmish Cav, they've got heavy Jav Cav and horse archers all over the place, so it's hard to catch them, they kept just dodging out of the way. I prioritised making a rear attack on the enemy's main group, but actually a unit of horse archers came away from that main group to stop me reaching it. So where the combat's happening with the Archibosphorus infantry, I can't make a decisive rear attack to try and shock those units into routing. 
Meanwhile, I did manage to catch all of those heavy jabs and archers into Malay. Unfortunately, they kept leaving Malay and can outpace my troops, so I would send my troops to come and help with the shocking of the main body of the enemy's force, and while they were doing that, they would then be attacked from behind when the enemy's skirmish cav came back to attack once again. And especially the jav cav is doing a lot of damage, and these archer cav, as you can see, can fire backwards while moving. So overall, it's really difficult to pin down and kill these guys. Even when we do get them in melee, like here, the enemy are so heavy with their skirmish cav that my troops actually can't really kill them. Overall, you can see my cavalry is taking heavy losses. Almost half the regiment is destroyed doing these maneuvers, and they almost rout. I'll make one final rear attack into the enemy's main fight, but actually there's pretty much nothing left at this point. It's just a few really heavy cav resisting the uh, Archibosphorus attack. Finally they rout, and all of the Jav cav and archers at the back rout as well in a chain rout. It's a decisive victory for the two armies named Daemons of Polymus. Archibosphorus taking the brunt and getting all the reward, of course, with the Massalians losing some key cavalry, but really for no gain. No. I think it is done. Sheathe your swords. Let the rest escape. Enough has been done to them this day. Their disaster requires no further completion. Besides, there is no time. We must form up before the walls and give cheer for the victory of our ally. Do not hesitate to discipline the men if they disagree. I know they aren't happy with the Bosphorans trying to mimic the legacy our troops have earned, but I see it as more of a compliment than they. Is it not flattering that they look up to us so? I think so. Perhaps you can persuade the men of this. Even if you can't, there will soon be an end to this campaign. The Saka cannot resist us now. So the battle was won. The Bosphoran daemons of Polymus are in terrible condition after the fight, as you can see, but they will be taking this town and replenishing. Our force is only suffering losses among one unit of cavalry in particular. The Kajuroi totally wiped out. We're going to release the captives that we took in this battle because we don't have that much more antagonism towards the Kajuroi at this stage. They don't threaten us or anything and they don't own any territory. It's logical for us to take, so we're not going to be so aggressive towards them. The Kachuroi don't really do anything we in reaction. I don't think they have any forces bloodshed. left up there. Gahaya comes to me with an interesting deal. They want to be my clients, Tate, yet wolves. again. They want a very manageable payment for it. Now, I was seriously considering this because I realized that I don't really need to take Gahaya. In fact, I could make them my client state in order to move south towards Mascat, the next settlement in Arabia, because that would give me a better jump point in order to move east against potential future enemies. And here is Mascat, in fact. They come right to me asking for a non-aggression pact, and because I was thinking of going to war with them right then, I turned that down. So in the next turn, we learn here that Cretheus has been wounded. It seems the council sent someone to attempt to assassinate him. They failed, luckily, but it does mean that someone else is going to have to command the hands of the Timukoi before Cretheus returns to service. Cleandros was back from service from his own wounds, and he has a decent amount of buffs, as you can see here. So I decided to make him the commander for now, although the army is unlikely to see battle before Cretheus returns because it's a long walk if he wants to reach Mascat. Here's Gahaya. You can see their forces still look pretty strong but their army out here in the desert seemed like it had been damaged. Perhaps they wanted to be my client because they were losing the war to the west with their original enemies. So my new target, Mascat, that port that has access to the ports on the other side of the strait there and further east, is going to be my next target. And we should be free to move right through Gahaya now with no hostilities so if we can go all the way there. So both Epiphroditos and Cleandros are going to move there now. Cleandros is going to fall behind in this, so Epiphroditos will have to wait at some point. But uh, soon they should be able to concentrate their forces and attack Mascat. So back up near the Crimea, we need to reset the war target. We need to ask Archibosphorus to go against the Sakharalka settlement here, the final one in our set of four that we're going to capture for Archibosphorus before we let them go their own way. The Kachuroi don't really have much left at this point, so they're probably not going to be a threat, and Sakharalka don't have any forces, they just have a really strong garrison. You can see there's a Kachuroi settlement to the west there, a small one to the west of the one that I captured, and they also have another one far to the north north 
But I think it's so far away, because it's all the way up there at the top of the screen, that it would take so long to actually get up there, I'm not going to make any attempt to go and subdue that settlement. But I might go for the one to the west of my settlement, just because it's close by, and would probably give me the opportunity to make Cachivory a client state. On that subject, I wanted to see if they would be my client state right now, which they wouldn't, because I would have accepted that. So perhaps if I take that place to the west, I can make the final one that's far away my client state, so you don't have to bother going out in the middle of nowhere and having the daemons be so far away from the core of our domain. So right now, I'm just going to fortify near the recently captured city and see if Archaeobosphorus moves right on to attack Zagaralka, because if they do, I'll join them in that campaign. The Arsini come back yet again, asking for non-aggression, still asking for money, despite me turning them down every time. Only 4,000, I could very easily afford that, but we're still going to turn it down, because we've got plans for the Arsini starting to brew now. Epiphroditos and Cleandros continue their movements through the desert, now unopposed. I realised that I'd actually hired a champion, that I wanted to go and join up with the Hand of the Tomb of Koi to train them up, because their experience is quite poor. He's a pretty long way away, <laughs> he's all the way back in Mesopotamia, but he can move faster than the army, so he might just about be able to catch up, so he's going to start his journey to uh, chase those armies and try and join one of them to train them. Now jumping back over to the daemons, you can see that Archibosphorus hasn't moved out against Sakuranka. They've actually replaced the army they have defending this new territory, while the daemons have gone back to their original territory. So it seems like they're not going to make an attack, and this time I'm not going to make the mistake of waiting to see if they ever do. Instead, we're going to start moving west. So I am going to try and move west and see if I can take that small Kachiroi settlement and just make that end the war with the Kachiroi if they're willing to accept that. The Sakuralka want an end to our war with them, with they're willing to be my client state for a very easy payment, but of course I can't accept this because I need Archibosphorus so to take their city in order to complete my deal with them, so we're going to throw that piece away. Now you can see my forces heading towards Britannia, still making good progress. It takes a really long time to sail up to Britannia, it's a really isolated location, but in a couple of turns we'll have that position reinforced. Meanwhile, it looks like Archibosphorus actually are going on the attack against the Sakuraka. They send forces into their lands to raid, so I decide to send the daemons back to stand near the city, hoping that this will give them the confidence to move that army in to start a siege, and if it does, we'll have both the daemons and the fleet with Evios helping in the siege of the city and should be able to make a very devastating attack. My fellows on the Massalian Council are sworn to secrecy in a certain matter, as am I. But I do not see the oath worthy of upholding, given the treacherous nature of the situation. I must inform you that the Massalians see your lands as mere vessels, vessels full of riches they can pour out to the rest of their conspirators across all the lands of the world. As I write, fresh forces sail for your shores, soon to double the number of Greeks who stalk your forests. I am not fond of their greed, nor of their power, so I warn you, now with the hope that you can prepare for a war that will decide the future of your people. In the meantime, my people do the same for Germania, for soon none will be safe. Progress through the desert continues, with Epaphroditos now at the border of Mascat's territory. This means it's now time to declare our intentions. I decided to go through my ally here in order to try and get some leverage over them because by joining their war they might be grateful and be willing to give me something in return. However, you can see there's only a moderate chance of them even letting me join the war and they wouldn't be my client state, so I probably wasn't going to get anything, I decided not to bother negotiating further. Let's just start the war. So with that established, we're now going to wait on the border here with Epaphroditos and see if Mascot come at us, hoping to defeat their main force in the field rather than having to go all the way to their settlement. Sakaralka come back once again asking to be my client state. It seems they don't really know where this conflict is going or what I'm trying to do, so I'm going to turn them down for a second time. We learned that there's peace between our new client state and our defensive ally, so that's good news. But assassins are after Cretheus once again. This time, they killed Cretheus's wife instead of him. So he is under serious pressure. He's still wounded from the assassination attempt against him. It seems he has very many enemies, perhaps, in the new regions he's been capturing. But at least we're only one turn away from getting him back into the army, where he's relatively safe. 
So Cleandros is going to have to continue taking his forces forward to link up with Epaphroditos, sorry, but Epaphroditos is not going to wait. He's going to go right out into enemy territory and fortify. This means he only used half his movements, so the hands of the Timukoi will slightly catch up, and it means if uh, Masked wants to attack him, he'll have a more powerful defensive position. While I was here, I noticed that both Persia and Parthava are suffering from attrition right now. It seems these nations are undergoing a food shortage and are losing strength. So that's very good to know because their potential future targets, although Parthava being my client state, is a little bit more of a shame to see them going down. So back up with the Sauka, Saka, sorry. we notice that Arche Bosphorus have totally abandoned their attack, leaving Artemios just standing there in front of the city. So his men are no longer going to accept his desires to uh, continue the Arche Bosphorus campaign. We're going to abandon them at this point and hope that they can continue on on their own. We're going to head west towards Petrodava and try and take it for ourselves. Mascat send out an agent to try and harass Epaphroditos' army, but that doesn't go very well, and that agent gets himself killed. Bad news. You can see he turns around there, meaning he's being harassed from behind as well. You can see there's a spy there. But it's not going to help them, because Cleandros has now moved the forces up, and we've got both our armies ready to continue their advance uh, in a moment. First, Artemios is going to move up towards Petrodava. He can't reach it this turn, but he can get right to the border, and the Kachiroi have nothing to stop him. So Cleandros is now replaced by Cretheus, who has returned from his period of being wound, wounded, sorry. And we're now able to continue with full strength. Plus, we can use that champion who's now caught up to start training the hands of the Timukoi. So Cretheus is going to start by advancing towards the Mascat settlements, just moving carefully to see if any forces appear in front of us. We learn that there are some forces guarding the settlement itself, but they're actually not all that powerful. A small navy and half an army, nothing we need to be too worried about at this stage, but it will require both stacks to successfully attack, because with the garrison involved, Cretheus would be quite outnumbered on his own. So he is going to wait for Epiphroditos, who's had, had his movement hampered by the enemy agents, so can't catch up very quickly, so next turn we'll have to make that attack. Meanwhile, Artemios is going to start the siege of Petrodava. The enemy force inside was moderately powerful, too powerful to auto resolve. I could make an assault and capture it, but I didn't feel like doing it right now, so we're going to jump over to Britannia, where our forces have landed. We are now doubling our strength on Britannia. Heraclades is going to be reinforced by Eustachus, and this gives us a much better chance of having successful war with the Iceni, who we know have at least two stacks because we can see them right now and probably have even more. So now in the next turn, it's time to make our attack on Mascat, and you can see the army and navy completely abandoned the settlement. They're not even defending it anymore, meaning this is going to be extra easy. Crethia starts the siege, and Epiphroditos brings his reinforcements in, his reinforcements slightly damaged by the harassing of the two enemy agents, but nothing major. We have a gigantic advantage on the balance bar, so we can go in an auto resolve in order to take the settlement. No idea where those forces went, but they left at exactly the wrong time. Perhaps they were willing to give up the settlement, not wishing to fight a defensive battle. So a relatively easy win with Epiphroditos taking the bulk of the losses. The occupation of the settlement increases our Imperium, unlocking extra agents and armies and navies, which is always handy. We can see there is an enemy navy out there at sea. It seems they just sailed off to the east. Not really sure where they're going because there's nothing out there. You can see we're really close to the edge of the map, in fact. But this new capture does give me access to two Persian ports that I could potentially land at if I was to war against Persia in the future. You can also see Persia and Parthava have stopped their attrition. So where will we go from here? We'll find out next time. The limit to the stability the Republic could offer its people was being approached. The mindset of the leadership had shifted from one that favoured trade to one that favoured political power over other states. This power could be used to ensure trade was stacked in Massalia's favour, but the application of force to far-flung parts of the world was stirring up opposition to the previously popular Republic. Seemingly without limit and increasingly without restraint, the strength of Massalia was envied and feared in equal measure. And no longer was their occupation performed in the tolerant style of Eusebius. Now captured lands were forced to accept the Greek laws and gods at spear point. It was effective, but stirred unrest ever further.